So first of all, what I'm going to do is I'm going to recap on, very briefly, on the first time we met uh, last quarter on biblical interpretation, just six or seven slides on that, and how we try and interpret the Bible correctly. And then I'm going to look at a section on our sources of authority and our basis for moral reasoning. As we're looking at how we decide whether something's right or wrong, what our authority is, because that's something that we need to understand in order to be self-aware about the way we think about things. And then we're going to look at some popular approaches to Christian ethics. And uh, you might be aware, you might uh, use one of these approaches yourself, for example, and not necessarily be aware that you're doing it. And then uh, finally, um, we're going to look at how we handle some complex issues and, a com a, and if we have time, to look at a couple of complex issues themselves. That is a lot to get through in an evening, um, but we're going to have a go. Okay. So just a reminder, just to delve into the, the Bible is a library. The Bible is a library of 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New, written over a period of about 1,650 years, from 1500 BC to 150 AD. It contains the Jewish law, the Torah, the prophets, the Tudor, and the writings and Psalms. And the New Testament contains the four Gospels, the history of the early church, which is Acts, and the 21 letters to Christians, and one prophecy, book of Revelation. And that was written from about the first letter, may have been written, was 1 Thessalonians, about AD 50, maybe 20, year, 20 or 30 years after Jesus uh, was teaching, and um, maybe Mark was about AD 65, not too long, within a memory of a generation or two of what Jesus came and did to do. And then the canon of these recognised books that were authoritative, that were helpful for the church, was agreed in about AD 400. Um, so quite a few hundred years later, but those books were in circulation and uh, helpful for the church um, before that time. So that's the key thing. The Bible is a library of all sorts of genres, literary styles. We have to read it as such. Okay, it is a, di a human divine collaboration. It's God-breathed, says in 2 Timothy 3.15. All scripture is God-breathed, useful for teaching, rebuking, and training in righteousness. But it needs interpreting. Uh, and um, Jesus himself interpreted the Bible. Remember, we read that a couple of weeks back, the road to Emmaus. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus explained to them what was said in the scriptures concerning himself. So he had to explain things that they were reading every day, those things they had needed explanation. Psalm 119 tells us the word of God contains God's wisdom, his understanding and his revelation. We look into the Bible for these things. However, it can be misused. We know from the Bible that the Bible itself is misused. Remember the Pharisees uh, were accused of hypocrisy uh, for using the law to uh, harm people. Uh, Jesus uh, accused them of hypocrisy in Matthew 15. And remember that the devil quoted scripture to Jesus when tempting him. And uh, in Luke 4, uh, Jesus uh, was tempted by the devil with scripture. So we have to be careful about the way we interpret the Bible. And that is how we, um, the way we interpret the Bible is our hermeneutic hermeneutics, this word, the way we interpret. And it is our lifelong privilege and pursuit. We are always trying to interpret the Bible and improve our interpretation of the Bible. And from the earliest days of the church, there have been alternative approaches to interpreting the Bible. I mentioned just a couple last time. For example, Oregon, um, in 185, 253 in Egypt, he was more into allegorical interpretation of the scripture. He would understand it was more metaphorical. Uh, whereas John Chrysostom in 347 um, um, was more keen on a plain historical reading of the text. So you can see completely different approaches right from the outset, the earliest days of the church. 
And then Cassian and then Augustine tried to bring these different approaches together, what they called the quadriga. It became the basic hermeneutical manual of the Middle Ages for centuries. And uh, that four-part method of interpreting the Bible. But then at the Reformation, the Protestant emphasis, emphasis rejected allegorizing and symbolism. Too much symbolism was going into it, they reckoned. And so they uh, were in favor of sola scriptura, a plain reading of scripture for all believers, uh, providing power, life, comfort, and instruction, as Luther put it. And so that we, instead of cl clergy trying to um, uh, allegorize or tell people what to believe, they, they were really into, and praise God, because here we are today, reading the Bible for ourselves, and that is what happened at the Reformation. Sola Scriptura, that we can determine uh, what God is thinking from the Bible itself. And so here are these principles that we've inherited from the Reformation. Sola Scriptura, the script that Scripture contains the whole will of God and can be understood by all believers with the help of the Holy Spirit. There is the principle of progressive revelation, as it's called, such that earlier parts of the Bible were written for and about earlier societies with very different cultural backgrounds and contexts. And so we understand that Christ superseded the ritual laws, for example, that we read in the Torah. But Christ came and his uh, one sacrifice on the cross meant that we do not have to participate in sacrificial offerings uh, of animals today. So there are parts of the Old Testament that have been superseded. And this is the principle of progressive revelation that actually God has brought us a long way, even within the context of the Bible. And then um, um, uh, the principle of Protestant interpretation is to look for authorial intent. What was the writer intending to say? And what was the context of how they wrote it? And this is a key way we interpret the Bible today, trying to understand what the author's original intention was as they wrote that and under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. It is that the, the, God did not hold the pen, human beings held the pen, but under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But through uh, understanding what the author intended, we can gain more insight about what God is trying to convey to us. And then finally, this Christocentric principle, interpreting scripture through the lens and priority of Christ. So in everything we read, uh, we understand that we start first with the Gospels and Acts and understand that Jesus is perfect theology. We understand that Jesus guides us into all truth with the way that he is. And so my suggestion is that if we ask these questions, what did Jesus say or do about it? And then what did Jesus' followers say or do about it? And then what did Jesus' forebears say or do about it? We can reach uh, an understanding through the Christocentric principle of what the Bible is telling us in the right way. Does that make sense? Are you keeping up? Okay, so this is just um, a, a recap. This was one of the key slides that helps us to understand perhaps our differences in interpreting the Bible. That met some people on, uh, on the uh, left-hand side of your screen will have more of a literalistic view of the words that they read. They have a sense that the Bible is fixed in its, um, and flat and flatter in its understanding. They are looking for precedents what happened in the Bible, and that's the fixed way that I can understand what God wants now, the precedent of the Bible. And then on the other end, there are those that felt that the Bible was an open-ended launch pad, that actually it was leading uh, to an open-ended view. This is the progressive view, that Jesus was setting up principles for us to follow and apply openly today in the culture and context we find ourselves. Now, if, depending on where we are on that continuum, we might find ourselves um, more literalist or more flexible uh, and more open-ended. I think it's fair to say that in traditional terms, the Church of England has been somewhere in the middle. That's what the Anglican middle way is, and that the Bible has been somewhat fixed, but with boundaries 
that of, of interpretation within that. We try and ask scripture to interpret scripture, but we're understanding that within its fixed framework. But the thing to understand is that different interpretations of the Bible on, on this continuum lead to different ethics, to different standards of behavior, to different outcomes on moral dilemmas. This is the key thing. Now you will be somewhere, probably, on this continuum. You may have an understanding of the Bible uh, on the, uh, towards the literalist side or the liberal or progressive side. You may be keener on precedents or principles. You have to ask yourself that question. This is something to wrestle through. And you may not know, uh, you may not be self-aware as to which you favour. That's one thing. So I went then finally to a practical approach. In faith, we choose the Bible as a final authority for matters of salvation, faith, and moral guidance. We pray for the Holy Spirit to help us. The Holy Spirit does, as Jesus promised, lead us into all truth. And then we, the key thing is to avoid interpreting uh, verses in isolation. The more of the Bible we can read and understand and memorize, the more we can hold, uh, draw on the widest possible survey of scripture. And we, in, we can in, um, reference reputable scholarship. So commentaries really help us understand those bits of the Bible we don't understand. And so we learn as much as we can about the context of a passage, asking these questions, who, what, where, why, and when, and asking that question, what was the authorial intent of a passage? And if the meaning of a text appears self-evident, sometimes it's best to avoid trying to squeeze another meaning into it. Sometimes we can lose ourselves down rabbit holes that don't really exist. That uh, Somebody said, the trouble with scripture is the bits we do understand, not the, not least the bits we don't. Sometimes that's tough enough as it is. And then as we suggest an interpretation, we do that with a trembling heart. I finished last time with a, a favourite quote from Soren Kierkegaard, who wrote uh, a, a book about, called Fear and Trembling, which is the way we go about ethics. We do that not believing that we have the final answer, but in fear and trembling, we hold humbly to what we understand God's will to be. So, that's last time. You've done that. Well, that wasn't too bad, was it? Just in a few slides, that was where we got to. That's quite a lot to cope with in itself. But now, I want to just cover sources of authority and our basis for moral reasoning. And a quick question for you to discuss for two minutes amongst yourselves. Who, where or what tends to inform your opinions about ethical and moral issues? Start thinking about that and maybe share that with your neighbour. Who, where or what tends to inform your opinions about ethical and moral issues? So is your brain hurting yet already? Perhaps some, give me some ideas of what a, what a, who, where or what tends to inform your opinions. We know that the, the answer is, of course, the Bible. But what's it in actually in reality? What's it in reality, do you think? Uh, perhaps shout out some ideas. Parents. Parents, yes. An upbringing, absolutely. What else? Mates. Friends, yes. Mates, that's right. The law. Okay, yes. Yes. What you read. Okay. Professional standards. Oh, professional standards. Yes. Your gut feeling. Gut feeling. Okay. Your gut feeling. Social media. Yeah. Any others? Things you hear in church. Things you hear in church. Oh, bless you, my dear. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, good. Well, I, I just wrote down a few. These are not, I, I, you know, I just wanted, but upbringing, friends, Google, BBC, <laughs> church, Bible, and my experience. Yes, those things. These are the things that do inform our opinions. And perhaps uh, I wonder what weight we place on these things. 
And so if we were to seek authoritative biblical insight, I think, I think Christians would agree, generally, we would say we want the Bible to be our authority. Our authority. But if we're seeking authoritative biblical insight, can we know if we're thinking God's thoughts? Can we know if we're interpreting the Bible correctly? We know that it, we, there's that wonderful verse where Jesus taught as one who had authority, not like the teachers of the law. So we know there's a difference between straightforward teaching and authoritative teaching. Jesus had it and they didn't. But remember that Satan quoted scripture and to tempt Jesus, and his first words in the Bible were, did God really say? And so Satan's job is to cast doubt on our understanding of God's word. James Packer, Jim Packer said, the problem of authority is the most fundamental problem that the Christian church ever faces. And hence I suggest it's one of the biggest problems we have to face in our lives as Christians. So C.S. Lewis said this, every moral judgment involves facts, intuition and reasoning. And if we're wise enough to be humble, it will involve some regard for authority as well. And this is the whole process of theology. Uh, Anselm of Canterbury um, was brilliant and he defined Christian theology as faith seeking understanding this process of wrestling to find understanding of what God is wanting for us. But we do trust that God has made us as reasoning creatures, as his people, to understand his will. Christians trust that God has all the answers to our questions and that he's given us spiritual and intellectual capacity to seek him through his word in order to discern the truth in love. We're here to learn. That's one of the gracious gifts of God, that we can learn what reality is like because God has made us that way and made us able to ask those questions. Actually, on a philosophical level, the fact that we can ask the question is extraordinary. The further you go into asking that, you realise that is amazing that we are made that way and uh, it is the um, central feature of sentient life that God has made. So I just want to cover some of the classic sources of authority that the churches have defined through the years. So the Catholic source of authority for many, many centuries has been three legs, these three legs of a stool. Um, firstly, uh, the magisterium from apostolic succession. So let me, let me explain what that means. So starting with Peter and the apostles who taught in the temple uh, from the earliest days of the church, they, had, they ordained people laying on of hands and they called that the apostolic succession. And so there, that was doctrine and best teaching was handed down through the magisterium. Uh, coming today to Pope Francis, for example, who is, uh, represents the magisterium and those um, clergy. And so that is one aspect of it. Then there is sacred scripture, the teaching of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus as the chief cornerstone. And then as time went on, of course, the tradition of those who had gone before. So the magisterium, sacred scripture and sacred tradition. Now, in the um, Reformation, there was quite a reaction to the magisterium. They'd got corrupt, they were wanting indulgences, the more you pay, the more I tell you what you want to hear kind of idea, and more forgiveness you get. And uh, it was getting corrupt, and that was one of the causes of the Reformation. And so for Anglicans, um, um, uh, after the Protestant Reformation, uh, our sources of authority have traditionally been scripture, tradition, and reason. You can see that reason overtook from the magisterium, that the individual could reason, given God's uh, intellectual capacity that he's given us, what it is uh, the, um, God is saying through the Bible. And this later became known as the three-legged stool, the via midi media, the middle way between Catholic and Reformed theology. And uh, the guy behind this was this uh, very handsome chap called Richard Hooker. 
uh, it, but who um, died in 1600. And, but this, uh, this traces its uh, background from the teaching of Thomas Aquinas. So Hooker believed there is a clear or plain sense in scripture and because it is clear, um, it should simply be believed through interpretation. And then he then argues that uh, reason and the church uh, tradition hold sway. And where the church rules on something that is in accord with reason, uh, this overrules any other opinion on offer. <laughs> if you see what I mean. So that's still uh, quite a church-based and a church-centric clerical um, system of authority. So then we come along to uh, um, reformers like um, Wesley and um, those um, um, other churches. And they added an additional source of authority. He subscribed to scripture, tradition and reason, but also then added experience into the mix. Um, because we have our experience to gain uh, wisdom from. So that became known as Wesley's uh, quadrilateral. Instead of just those three sources of authority, there were four. And then time moved on, and um, uh, um, the non-conformist churches uh, based a lot more on different sources of authority. And over time, we then come to later additional sources of authority. Uh, for example, John Macquarie was an Anglican um, theologian. He was described as Anglicanism's most distinguished systematic theologian in the second half of the 20th century. And he suggested that revelation, culture, and context should be added into the mix. So instead of just the three-legged stool, you've got a multi-legged stool here. Lots of things adding to the authoritative understanding of the Bible. The key to understand with all this, I don't know if you can, uh, you can I hope you can read this, is that it travels effectively from one side, which is just the clerical edict, right to the other side, where it is personal experience and gut feeling. Does that make sense? And the word between these two is heteronomy or autonomy. Heteronomy means you take your, your understanding of authority from outside yourself. And so you're looking to other people, you're looking to the church or clerical edict to understand what your authority is. So you're just simply looking for the answer. And maybe a papal edict would do it for you, and that's the end. Do you see what I mean? On the other side, you've got autonomy. And uh, really, I am becoming my own authority. So, isn't this interesting? This is an interesting thing. That somewhere in the middle, of course, we've got strict scripture, tradition, and reason, and the middle way. Which way do you reckon society is heading? <laughs> Definitely that way. The search, the search uh, for authenticity, as it's called, for Gen Zs and uh, the youngest generations, is a cruise towards autonomy. And so self-reliant authority, that is a key direction of travel. And so you hear phrases, you've got to be true to yourself. That is the definition of autonomy in its purest form, true to yourself only. Now, the trouble is, of course, that is entirely subjective. You can do what you want, <laughs> entirely. Of course, at the other end, I can only do what I'm told, which leads to auto autocracy and, um, um, a, a, um, and the danger of a dictatorship and often spiritual abuse. But there, I suggest there is an equal danger with autonomy. Now we have to be self-aware about which way we drift in this continuum. And society and, and contemporary culture, there is a big tide that direction. <laughs> it is pushing towards autonomy. So I suggest that if we are to keep the scriptures central, we have to have a continual dialogue 
uh, between these things, keeping the Bible central with our experience, with the witness of the Holy Spirit, that sanctified guts feeling that we've been talking about. Then we have the church's input and the teaching uh, that you're given and your reason and understanding the logic that goes behind that. And we have to check at each point with the Bible uh, whether it stands up and we have to scrutinise in dialogue with the Bible all the time. And that keeps us, keeps us <coughs> central. Okay, I want you to take um, two minutes now just to reflect uh, which direction uh, you're heading personally on this chart and whether you feel you've been influenced over the past 10 years to a different way. The past 10 years, how have you drifted and what may have made you drift? And is that healthy? Two minutes to chat about it. Go for it. I think my conclusion is from everybody that I've I, I talked to in the past, um, well, 25 years now of ministry, I know that uh, many people have been changing towards autonomy uh, and drifting that way, just even in the past 25 years, as society and culture have changed. And I think there is a more autonomous view, particularly as individualism takes a grip uh, of our society. So I think it is fairly normal for us to be um, heading towards autonomy, but I think it's helpful if we're self-aware of that and perhaps understand that the danger is at the end point and the extreme end. If we end up in, in extreme circumstance, we are only our own authority. That is the danger. So I want to go on now to um, looking at uh, how we handle complex issues. Given all I've just said uh, about um, these issues. So here are some things. When discussing complex issues, we need to keep in mind as Christians, firstly, our view of the Bible, our hermeneutic, and the fact that that may be different from other people within the same room. That's the first thing to be self-aware of. So is your view of the Bible a sealed repository of commands and precedents? You know, are you more conservative in your understanding of the way the Bible is? Or is it an open launch pad where Jesus instigated loving principles? That is a key understanding that you need to keep hold of and in your mind as you're having a discussion. Because it's like you can enter into a discussion and be on completely different starting points. You can be trying to discuss something from completely different perspectives. You need to be self-aware together of how you can do it. I'd, I'd rather favour a system of badges that you put on. Like, I'm an open-ended sort of person or I'm a closed... Because that would just help the discussion. Because you might end up starting from the same sort of place. The second thing is your source of authority may be different from others. Others may be more looking to exterior sources for authority and what the church says goes, for example, or they may be more subjective. They may be more looking towards their own experience. And then the third thing to take into account is our past experience may be different from others, of course. And let's recognise that pain and pride and prejudice and insecurities can affect our ability to reason prayerfully and objectively. That is one of the tough things that goes. Pain is carried with us. And that can feed in, either consciously or subconsciously, to any discussion that we have about a complex moral issue. If we've been hurt in the past in one particular area, it's very, very difficult for us to discuss it objectively. Our emotions immediately get dragged into the equation. So just keep those things in mind as we discuss things together. Here's some advice on handling complex issues from Philippians 1 verse 9 to 10. And this is a wonderful verse. I think it's amazing. And this is my prayer. This is Paul speaking, um, who sometimes was controversial. But of course, uh, uh, this is a wonderful prayer. This is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Now, when you look up that verse and the Greek words that Paul used, actually there's more to it 
than just the NIV will give you. And so these things, uh, I pray that your love may abound more and more in knowledge, yes, and depth of insight, but judgment, right judgment, so that you may be able to discern what is or be discerning over controversial matters. They just say what is best, but actually you may translate the word there, controversial matters, divisive issues, and may be pure and blameless, sincere and without offence for the day of Christ. So he starts off praying for love, knowledge and insight so that we can discuss controversial issues together. That is the framework by which we can discuss these things and maintain our unity as a church. As all, as all saints, there'll be a ton of different understandings of things here in this place. But if we all prayed for love, uh, insight and knowledge, we can discuss these things well together and go forward and remain pure and blameless without offence. That's the key thing, to not take offence until the day of Christ. Good, so I want to cover some um, popular approaches to Christian ethics. And I've, I've, I, I'm, this is not an exhaustive list by any means. This is just Tom's cobbled together list of some popular phraseology and things. And uh, forgive me if it's uh, un unclear. But first of all, um, most Christians will acknowledge three, uh, Jesus' three love commands. Jesus' three love commands as being central to our understanding of what he came to do. And the three love commands, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength and mind. That's the great commandment. Then the second one, the golden rule, which is love your neighbour as yourself. And then the new commandment, that's the third one he gave. And uh, uh, interesting, love one another as I have loved you. Fascinating ethical principles there because he demonstrated exactly what love looks like through his own actions. So those three love commands. And then the, the classic way is deductive reasoning. What does the Bible say? We read the stories, we understand what Jesus um, has commanded us, uh, but by deductive reasoning. And so if we are thinking about an issue that is contemporary, uh, we take what we know of the Bible and we deduce from the principles that we find in there what is right applied in another situation. Deductive reasoning. Uh, so on many issues like the sanctity of life is a key principle that the Bible teaches. The sanctity you've been made in the image of God. We often hear that quoted. This is deductive reasoning and understanding. What does the Bible say? Then, of course, another classic, many, many people, including me, I've found this helpful at times, WWJD, what would Jesus do? But what might be the problem with that? Sorry? Hey, carry on. I cut, sorry. He didn't have a mobile phone. No. Interesting. What, interesting. So how can we... That is exactly it how would when we're facing contemporary issues that relies on our own understanding of, of Je how Jesus would act in a particular current context so again it is helpful but it is veering towards subjective reasoning subjective autonomous reasoning uh, and then of course there are classic e ethical theories utilitarian the greater good <laughs> we've probably all thought about that um, at different times choose the greater good and then Kantian uh, e uh, ethics is just do the right thing now don't worry about the consequences don't worry about the consequences just do the right thing here and now if somebody's asking you to lie for the greater good that's wrong he suggests for example just do exactly what is right in this moment and of course that breaks down because there are then you can say, well, the consequence of doing that good thing was dreadful. <laughs> you know, so, so these are different approaches that people have taken. But I want to suggest that um, balancing up is something that we all perhaps might be doing unconsciously or consciously. And we balance up scripture, tradition, reason and experience as part of our Christian walk. And we take various bits and pieces uh, of what we know of the Bible, what we know of uh, 
uh, tradition within the church, what we know um, of, of our experience, and we put them on a, a, a weighing balance. And we try and start balancing things up. For example, how did Jesus behave? How did Jesus teach? We put that on the scales. And then what did Paul teach about it? What, did, what does the church teach about it? We pop that on the scales. And we consciously or unconsciously give different weight to that until we find which way we go. And that is, sometimes it's more difficult when it's really very finely balanced. I want to give you just some pastoral principles for continuous learning. And these are very helpful um, things. So we continually wrestle with moral dilemmas and difficulties. We continue to do this. Uh, And so when we have a pastoral experience, something confronts us. We then go and do research and study. This is the Christian way. We, We pray about it. We research the Bible. We study the scriptures. We pray and reflect about what it might mean, how that might work out in practice, and then we give a gracious response. And then we see what goes wrong, and we try by error and blessing to see and repeat the cycle, rinse and repeat. I suggest this is a lifelong pursuit. It's a lifelong pursuit. Um, There are some helpful um, pastoral principles that the Church of England um, published, and I think these are really good in the Living in Love and Faith. Um, uh, series Uh, and so acknowledging prejudice acknowledging our own prejudices if we can understand how we are prejudiced speak into silence sometimes it can be abusive just to not speak that can say as much as talking Uh, then addressing ignorance sometimes we don't know what we're talking about and haven't experienced things casting out fear Admitting hypocrisy where we are hypocritical ourselves. So again, an open-handed approach to discussion. And a key one is paying attention to power. Power dynamics cripple conversations and make things very difficult. Power, we may not know how much power we exert. Uh, even, even in here, I'm, I'm now, right now, I'm exerting power. I'm two steps above you. I'm speaking through a PA system. I am exerting power. No, I'm, no, no, no. <laughs> no. What I'm saying, but we have to be aware of this in case because we can all too easily abuse that. This is a dangerous. This is a dangerous place. You're subject to more judgment the more power that you exert. I would suggest. So that's just a helpful set of guidelines for dealing with complex issues. So, here are 10 10 hot potatoes that are contemporary complex issues. Things that uh, you may or may not have figured out an opinion on yet. And actually, we may be continually going through this cycle of trying to learn, trying to understand, and trying to help. So, uh, gender identity, what does that mean? Abortion, what do we think about that? Divorce and remarriage, human sexuality and and, uh, gay uh, issues. Uh, Women in ministry, genetic engineering and bioethics growing at a pace. Can we keep up with all the developments uh, and what the implications are as people fiddle about with DNA? Pacifism and war, that could come home to roost. What is it, what is our opinion about, was Jesus pacifist or not? Question. Uh, Economic systems, we are in a capitalist society. Is that the right godly way? Maybe not. Maybe it is. Maybe there are good bits and bad bits. But I think uh, sometimes um, we need to be aware of what system we are inhabiting. What about this growing one of artificial intelligence and human augmentation? That will start taking over. That will happen that actually there will be a new generation of people that are augmented by AI. And they will be at an advantage. And how do we think about that? What does God think about that? How can we help prevent? There are people writing now saying we must step in and and, um, stem the development of general AI because it could be very, very harmful to humanity. Are we taking that seriously? What does God think about that? And And then the final one I've got here is environmental care and climate change. 
We're told the, the, the planet is on a tipping edge. We don't have all the scientific facts at our fingertips. How do we respond? And what steps should we take as individuals? Ah, overwhelming, hey? <laughs> but can we solve all this in a night? No, we cannot. Let me just highlight just a few more other complex issues. Uh, some of these have been more resolved and we may be, I, I just put these that we may be a tad more settled about this in a typical church like uh, All Saints. But infant versus believers baptism, uh, for example. Uh, people were killed over this years back. Uh, Sabbath rules and the Lord's Day, Seventh Adventist Church, broke away because they were keen on keeping the Sabbath special, things like that, on a Saturday. The work of the Holy Spirit today, there's the cessationists and those who believe that the, that the Holy Spirit ceased all activity at the closing of the canon of Scripture, whereas uh, I think a, a, a large-ish majority, since today, of evangelicals at least, sense that the Holy Spirit is still active in the church today. And then there are other things, head cover. these are all New Testament things, head coverings, why aren't you wearing your hats? And uh, tattoos, disgusting or not as the case may be. Um, piercings, dress codes, all these things have at one time or another been a subject to controversy, uh, controversy. Well, the way you say controversy is a controversial thing. <laughs> then there is clerical authority. The Reformation was really uh, largely driven by that. How much authority should be given to people? Eschatology, end times theology, what happens? Millet people have really fallen out over which thousand years it is, when it, when it takes place, and all this sort of stuff. But here's one, slavery. Slavery was debated as a positive godly thing for about 100 years or not in the church. It was then largely the church that concluded by the 1750s that this was a bad thing, and that then led society, it really did, to the 1833 Abolition Act and many more. So this is a continual cycle of, of debating challenging things and we apply these principles. Okay, I'm gonna give you a little five minute break and then we're going to come back and talk about primary and secondary issues and then we're gonna look at um, a couple of uh, real life issues today including human sexuality if we can handle it. Okay, can you handle it? Okay, folks, can I call you back to order? Um, as I've, I've handed out a complex issue handout. If you haven't got one, then just wave to me and I'll get you one. Okay. Has everybody got one of these? So, I just want to um, can resume by talking about primary and secondary issues. Um, so primary issues are agreed upon by all Christians everywhere. And these are doctrines that are required for salvation. Uh, fascinatingly, we sang the song um, earlier on, which is the creed. And uh, um, these are the primary issues. And that song is so wonderful because every Christian can sing it with gusto. And these are, those are the primary issues we all agree upon. And it's typically expressed in the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, etc. So, and that is about God, the Holy Trinity, Trinitarian theology, who created all things. We um, proclaim the Lordship of Jesus Christ, by whom all things were made. His crucifixion, whose real life crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, ascension and return. The Holy Spirit, the oneness of the church, baptism, the future resurrection, and eternal life. That's the primary issues in, that have been agreed down the centuries um, by the church. And then there are those other uh, primary issues that the church sort of are being, are being challenged today increasingly. And that is the authority of the Bible as God's inspired or infallible word, that debate uh, coming along. What does that mean, inspired and infallible? Uh, some people would say, I believe in God's word being infallible. Uh, it's my interpretation that is fallible. And uh, that's an interesting way of uh, putting it. But also, the nature of humanity, sin, salvation, and eternity seem to be primary issues that were um, uh, unchallengeable that now perhaps are challengeable. What does original sin mean? 
for example, that doctrine that we've all understood, but um, Augustine and Augustine defined, but now is under something of a challenge. So we do we do recognise, though, thankfully, the creeds are a helpful unifier for churches today uh, that uh, subscribe to uh, some orthodoxy. Uh, then I want to just. Uh, Um, talk about holding truth in tension and this um, discipline of Christians, holding truth in tension. And I love this uh, quotation from Bill Jackson in this book called The Quest for the Radical Middle. Let me read it to you. Biblical truth is found in the radical middle, holding propositions such as the divinity and humanity of Christ in tension. Satan's strategy has from the very beginning been been to challenge these tensions. His first recorded words caused Eve to doubt God's motive in prohibiting Adam and Eve from eating of one of the trees in the garden when they could eat from all the rest. Satan tempted them to harmonize the apparent incongruity and in doing so, they lost the radical middle of affirming God's yes and God's no at the same time. I quite like that as uh, as something that we need to grow into understanding how God can say yes and no at the same time. And different scriptures will emphasise different things at the same time. And we we as human beings want to rationalise everything. We want everything in neat boxes, whereas God is bigger and more multidimensional than we can ever imagine. Then there's another scripture, um, uh, helpful thing here from Walter Brueggemann. As often happens in scripture, we are left with texts in deep tension, if not in contradiction with each other. The work of reading the Bible responsibly is the process of adjudicating these texts that will not be fit together. So um, that is the, the challenge that we face, uh, is to hold the biblical text Uh, intention, holding and balancing what we feel and what the Lord is leading us to understand. So here's an interesting um, um, proposition. Is it okay to change your ethical position? Um, People will often ask me, you know, what's your position on this matter? And you, I might have a go at saying it, but the interesting thing is I couldn't guarantee that my position will stay the same. Um, and may not alter. Um, For example, I think we have biblical examples of people changing their ethical position and their understanding of doctrine, even even within the Bible text itself. So, for example, the Apostle Peter changed his view of food laws in Acts 10. Uh, You know, get up, Peter, kill and eat. This was uh, he, he said, you know, I'd never, Lord, I would never do that. I've always subscribed to the Jewish food laws, whereas the Holy Spirit instructed that Gentiles should be free to change uh, in that sense. And then the Council of Jerusalem abandoned the requirement for Gentiles to be circumcised in order to be Christians. That was the earliest church understanding that they would become, it, this Christianity started as a sect of Judaism, uh, but then that was changed in Acts 16. Uh, When James said, It's my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. This is a great principle to hold in mind as we debate complex issues. Let's not make it difficult for people who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, idolatry, from sexual immorality. Maybe he was calling that a primary issue. Interesting. Hold that up. From the meat of strangled animals and from blood. These things which uh, may dilute or compromise their difference from the pagan society around them. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. So perhaps a distinctiveness from the Judaism from which they come. But again, so uh, that, is, that is just a background to the change that they permitted, a thoughtful change, uh, helpfully debated and, and um, communicated. But Paul did write to Timothy, watch your life and your doctrine closely, persevere in them, because if you do so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. And so Paul is promoting the idea that good doctrine promotes salvation. <laughs> 
It's an interesting one to hold on to. Uh, so we need to be careful. I need to be careful in what I teach. I wanted to give an example of somebody, a senior pastor, who has changed their view and changed their doctrine in current terms. And uh, this came out, this was a, a lovely thing to read just as I was preparing uh, for this, in this uh, latest edition of Christianity magazine. And um, uh, this is May 2023's edition, and it has an, int an article all about Rick Warren. You would uh, probably have heard of Rick Warren, uh, Saddleback Church in America, the author of The Purpose Driven Life. And a lot of this article is about how he changed his mind on um, ordaining women and the role of women in ministry. And uh, so he changed his mind when he was st um, studying passages of the Bible, preparing for another conference about evangelism and how there's these goals for 2033, 2,000 years after Jesus was crucified, uh, to uh, have a great effort in evangelism for the next 10 years uh, to share the Great Commission. And uh, so he was reading about the Great Commission in Matthew 28, looking at the verbs there, go, make disciples, baptize and teach, was Jesus' commission to everybody. And it suddenly struck Rick, was that just to men? Or was that to all disciples? And I think he started concluding it was his instruction to baptize and teach must apply to women too. And then at Pentecost in Acts 2, the Holy Spirit was clearly poured out on both men and women because Peter felt obligated to explain it. He said, I will pour out my spirit in the last days, says the Lord, but on both men and women. And so Peter explained that the Holy Spirit was at work in both. And then after the resurrection, of course, Jesus tells a woman first to share the good news, the primacy of, the, uh, of Mary sharing with um, the apostles. She was the apostle to the apostles in that sense. And so on balance, Rick changed his mind. He concluded the balance had shifted in his understanding of scripture and he tilted the other way. And so he started ordaining uh, women and um, blessing their ministry, which got Saddleback chucked out of their denomination. So that's the sort of challenge that he faced. Um, but uh, he felt on balance that was the right change of attitude. Uh, that happened to me when I think when I first started ministry 30 years ago, I was uh, in favour of male headship uh, in terms of ministry, but now I am a full proponent of women in ministry. The same uh, journey of scriptural understanding uh, occurred to me, and so I sympathise with Rick Warren's uh, change there. So bless you ladies, thank you for being our leaders. Okay, so um, let's go on to um, a complex issue. People want to think about, this is the hottest potato of the time, so uh, um, prayerfully I, I humbly submit some ideas to you um, on same-sex marriage. So I've, I've handed out to everybody a little briefing paper that I first composed in 2015, I revised it in uh, 2018, just with as language perhaps developed a little bit, and then I've updated it uh, recently as well, just uh, in, in minor terms. Um, but I wanted just to go through this because it shows some of the principles that we've been talking about uh, in this presentation so far, in action, in the briefing. Uh, I've tried to keep it brief, um, but I hope it's some, in some way it exposes some of the things I've been talking about uh, in, in the way we might handle and think about the complexities of the situation. Does that make sense? So you've got this in front of you. I will just read it in a sense, and um, uh, I'll probably find uh, mistakes in it. So, although there is broad agreement amongst Christians that m the marriage covenant is the most appropriate setting for a loving sexual relationship and the nurture of children, there is much current debate as to whether this grace should be extended to homosexual as well as heterosexual couples. And this question essentially boils down to whether God blesses homosexual sex as a legitimate expression of love and faithfulness in the context of family life. Proponents on both sides of the argument call upon scripture, tradition and reason to bolster their case. 
and both clarify that it is homosexual practice that is under discussion rather than homosexual orientation. However, sexual intercourse is assumed to be a core component of marriage. And whilst it may be unfair to label the opposing sides as progressives and conservatives, for the sake of this summary document, these terms will be used. However, in the, use, the use of progressive or conservative in this paper only refers to views about homosexual sex rather than any other theological debates. There are 12 references to homosexual sexual behaviour in the Bible, nine in the Old Testament and three in the New Testament. Genesis 19 verse 5, Sodom and Gomorrah, and Judges 19 verse 22, the men of Gibeah, are stories containing violent homosexual abuse. So it is difficult to include these in any discussion about the morality of consensual homosexual practice. If you hear somebody talking about it's like Sodom and Gomorrah, discard that conversation. It's not. That was about very violent uh, actions and uh, lack of protection uh, for the people involved, as much as it was about the sexual activity. That's one key thing to understand. Five more Old Testament references clearly refer to homosexuality in the context of cult prostitution. So that's in Deuteronomy and Kings and two Kings. And so it is only the remaining five that are central to the biblical discussion about conceptual, monogamous, homosexual, sexual practice. Does that make sense? So we're limit, we've, we've drawn it down by, con, by seeing what the context of those scriptures are. And the scriptures that are relevant may be summarised as follows. In the Old Testament, Leviticus 18, those are Torah law commandments about unlawful sexual relations, uh, and then Leviticus 20, uh, Torah law punishment for homosexual practice. Uh, and those are objective, if you like. They're not in the context of any violence or cult, uh, cult, ac cultic activity as part of worship. Does that make sense? Yeah. Then in the New Testament, Romans is the first one. Paul cites homosexual practice as evidence of rebellion against God. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 10, Paul warns against effeminate and homosexual practice. 1 Timothy 1, 8 to 10, Paul warns that homosexual practice is contrary to sound teaching. Now, um, it's important to remember that Jesus does not mention homosexuality in his teaching at all. Uh, however, he does affirm God's original intentions for heterosexual marriage in the second creation account in Genesis 2 during a discourse about marriage and divorce in Matthew 19. Bear in mind, Jesus talked much more explicitly about divorce and adultery and marriage than he ever did about homosexual sex, for example. Now, the progressive case in favour of the church's acceptance and blessing of faithful, monogamous, homosexual, marital sex springs from a pastoral plea for inclusion and, uh, bear in mind what we've just been talking about, a hermeneutic of love to the biblical texts. Somewhere between 5 and 10% of people have a homosexual orientation and the rejection of homosexual behaviour by the church means that many can feel excluded from the community. Suicide rates amongst gay Christians are higher than normal as a result. Steve Chalk, who is one of the leader of the Oasis uh, group of churches and um, <coughs> Uh, uh, somebody who is uh, a Baptist pastor, who is a Baptist pastor, and a great biblical scholar. He's written multiple books on atonement and uh, theories of um, uh, how we get society, um, the church to help on sociological issues. So he's done a great work for the church uh, in terms of helping um, people in need. And he explains the progressive position by comparing homosexual inclusion to the issues of slavery and the role of women in church leadership. He argues that slave keeping is endorsed in the Old Testament and although the New Testament proposes a more humane form of slave keeping, it fails to deliver a clear cut protest against it. And yet the vast majority of Christians today celebrate 
the abolition of slavery. Remember, there was a kind of a hundred year long debate before that, but before 1750, uh, about whether it was biblical or not. And those who wanted to keep slaves were um, uh, endorsed it. The Bishop of Exeter was a slave owner. <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, Chalk believes it is similarly inconsistent to reject homosexual practice, yet approve of women in church leadership when Paul forbids it in 1 Timothy 2. Instead, he suggests that the trajectory of the Bible's teaching is towards radical, the radical inclusion that Jesus taught and modeled. Now, that, just that, an aside on that. So remember the open-ended view of scripture? Whereas, uh, as opposed to the closed, um, can the closed, um, self-contained view of scripture, Steve Chalk is definitely a Jesus trajectory kind of interpreter. Does that make sense? So Steve is very much as an open-ended springboard. Conservatives point out that Jesus was not always inclusive because he rejected immorality, urging repentance and redemption. Even an inclusive pastoral ethic will have limits which will leave some feeling rejected. For example, siblings are not currently permitted to marry even if they wanted to enter a covenant relationship. The church always has to deal with the tension of being inclusive whilst rejecting immorality. They also argue that <clears throat> across all cultures for millennia, heterosexual marriage has been normative providing the best foundation of raising children instead of them having to cope with the confusion of surrogacy or adoption. Conservatives feel that blessing same-sex marriage would violate scriptural authority. And Greg Downs writes, since the scriptures are crystal clear on the issue, my fear is that any shift to embrace this new interpretation is nothing short of a denial of the authority of the Bible itself. So again, uh, questions about biblical authority come into the fore, for, about how we uh, view that. But again, over issues of um, women in leadership, for example, that was often um, uh, viewed as a, uh, a challenge to biblical authority. So the question, the question for Christians on both sides of the argument is how we interpret the Bible in order to discern if covenantal homosexual sex constitutes immorality. Both sides want to honour the Bible as God's inspired instrument for communicating his will for humanity. Both want to honour Jesus as the word made flesh. And as we look at the scriptures, we can apply a Christ-centred approach to interpretation by asking the following questions in the following order. And these uh, repeat of what I uh, shared earlier. What did Jesus say and do concerning the issue? What did Jesus' followers say and do concerning the issue? What did Jesus' forebears say and do concerning the issue? If the most weight applies to what Jesus said and demonstrated in the Gospels, followed by his followers and then forebears, in many cases, the balance of the evidence leans towards a verdict. For example, in the case of slavery, Jesus said that his mission was to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and release for the oppressed in Luke 4.18. Paul condemned slave trading in 1 Timothy 1 verse 10, particularly slave, slave kidnapping uh, was the word that he uses, and wrote to Philemon asking for clemency for Onesimus, a runaway slave, which is why the abolitionist view uh, soon gained traction amongst believers. The case for women in leadership tips in favour of role equality if you place more weight on Jesus' inclusion of women as key figures in Jesus' ministry, despite Paul's concerns in 1 Timothy 2. So the question for the church is to discern from the Bible whether Jesus, his followers or forebears said or did anything that would, on balance, indicate God's blessing of same-sex marriage and sex. It's our responsibility to prayerfully examine the scriptures and consider the pastoral implications of adopting a particular stance. There you go. Okay, so that's a briefing paper, which um, I've, I, hope and, I hope and pray gives a fair and balanced view of both sides of the argument for and against. And I think it's really, really important um, to do the research and put the effort in on these complex issues 
uh, rather than just jumping in with um, an opinion that we might have plucked from a source of authority that we can't even remember. Does that make sense? So we have to put the work in is one of the key things. And then we have to be willing to debate and discuss um, with other people with a gracious and open mind, knowing our own hermeneutic, our own sources of authority, and what baggage we might carry and the prejudice we might carry with that. And so um, for me, um, as I've worked this through, one of the things that is happening in Bath at this time is that since the general synod debate on uh, same-sex issues and um, blessing civil unions it happened uh, two months ago now, um, often uh, churches have been uh, incensed or worried about the future and uh, have actually, in many cases, been getting into what I call trenches, uh, digging their trenches and taking their stand on either side of the debate, jumping in either for conservative views or progressive views. And uh, for me personally, I have a high view of unity in the church and holding these debates uh, carefully and keeping the truth in tension. On balance, I would say I am doctrinally conservative based on what I read and what I've seen in this paper and the evidence that been, has been placed before me. But on the other side, I want to say that I am pastorally compassionate. And so that means that A, I won't, you won't ever find me saying I'll never change my position. <laughs> B, if a couple or somebody came before me, I don't know how I will respond. I will prayerfully go and consider each and every case that would come to me and the issues that are presented within my congregation, within the people that are in front of me. I will not just simply say, I have decided my position, I'm in my trench and I'm going to um, uh, uh, dig my heels in. Because I think that the, that um, uh, allows room for God's Holy Spirit to teach and instruct me in the ongoing cycle of pastoral reflection on these issues. And so, uh, as I say, right now, I would call myself doctrinally conservative, but pastorally compassionate. Now, that also it brings the, the challenge of internal inconsistency. <laughs> it really does. Because I could, um, you could have, I could hold to a particular set of doctrines and be faced uh, with an ethical problem and find myself in an inconsistent position. I think that is the burden of carrying my cross that the Lord has asked me to carry in some sense. Um, and I was, I was uh, uh, greatly encouraged to find that actually uh, um, uh, more informed church leaders such as myself uh, take this position. Uh, whether I'm allowed to quote from Pope Francis or not, I don't know, but I think actually uh, it's, I find it fascinating that he is uh, adopting this position of doctrinal conservatism and pastoral flexibility. He's being criticised for it, but I think it's interesting. And so he issued this um, um, uh, paper called um, Amoris Laetitia, they always speak in Latin, don't they? On Love and the Family, um, a few years back. And uh, this caused great waves. But I read, I read this quotation, it says this, uh, from our awareness of the weight of mitigating circumstances, psychological, historical, and even biological, it follows that without detracting from the evangelical ideal, there is a need to accompany with mercy and patience the eventual stages of personal growth as these progressively appear, making room for the Lord's mercy, which spurs us on to do our best. Pope, John, um, Pope um, Francis writes this, I understand those who prefer a more rigorous pastoral care, which re leaves no room for confusion. But I sincerely believe that Jesus wants a church attentive to the goodness which the Holy Spirit sows in the midst of human weakness. A mother who, whilst clearly expressing her objective teaching, always does what good she can, even if in the process her shoes get soiled by the mud of the street. I think that's fascinating, isn't it? 
The church's pastors, in proposing to the faithful the full ideal of the gospel and the church's teaching, must also help them to treat the weak with compassion, avoiding aggravation or unduly harsh or hasty judgments. The gospel itself tells us not to judge or condemn. Jesus expects us to stop looking for those personal or communal niches which shelter us from the maelstrom of human misfortune and instead to enter into the reality of other people's lives and to know the power of tenderness. Whatever we do so, whenever we do so, our lives become wonderfully complicated. <laughs> I think that's, that just struck me as the Lord. I just felt I was godly. And that's, that, that's the Pope. Um, I, I found that amazing. So my, my conclusion, I'm going to leave you with that, that it, there is this wonderful uh, complication <laughs> to handling complex issues that is our, both our privilege and our burden to carry. And I think in this church, I want us to be a wrestling church and a compassionate, a compassionate church. I do not want us to lob grenades at one another and uh, uh, for the sake of feeling right. <laughs> Does that make sense? Uh, it will, that, it brings with it more difficulty and the risk of um, compromise and internal inconsistency. However, I will preach and uh, um, I will teach uh, doctrinal conservative values whilst at the same time leaving the door open for pastoral inconsistency. Amen. <laughs> <laughs>